Well, this Labor Day weekend, is it not? Everyone have some good plans for tomorrow? We'll say all that. Yeah. Um, in honor of Labor Day, you know, Labor Day was meant to honor those in the physical workforce. And in honor of Labor Day, I wanted to honor some of those laborers who had some of the mis most difficult jobs when I was growing up. And that was the McDonald's workers at 9 p.m. on Sunday evenings. Why do I say those are the most difficult um, hours for somebody to work at McDonald's? Well, because that was when our youth group of 20 so middle school, high school students all went together to McDonald's at 9 p.m. And we were, we, were, we were a youth group, you know? We were crazy. We were energetic, we were loud, we sang happy birthday to each other way off key and way too loudly. And we had a great time. But those workers, they were very patient with us. I especially remember one Sunday where the, um, there was a soda machine that you get your Sprite from, right? From McDonald's, because that Sprite is the only one that I would drink being in high school. And it was kind of leaking that one Sunday night. So, me being in high school, I figured I'd just see what happens. <laughs> so I got my soda, went back, sat down, and as more and more people got their soda from the Sprite fountain, the Sprite fountain became a Sprite fountain. <laughs> and this thing gushered up and sprayed all over the McDonald's so that nobody could walk past the soda machine. And my, I thought it was hilarious. I was just sitting there cracking up the whole time. And the workers, bless them, they had no idea what to do. They were just sitting there staring at the thing because they, they weren't in movement at all. <laughs> There's just silence and just like this, what, what, what do we do? That happened for a good five minutes. <laughs> and then somebody broke the silence and called the manager and said, hey, we got this problem. Can you come in and fix the situation? It's a funny story from my childhood about what it looks like for there to be a sticky situation. Literally, a sticky situation. I'm sorry, Rick's coming back next week. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there is this silence until someone has to break the silence for things to be remedied. I could choose less fun stories, stor stories of relationships so at odds that no one talks to each other until someone has to break the silence. Stories of abuse, where no one in the situation wants to speak up because of fear and shame. Stories of hidden addiction or silent sin where we don't speak up because if we do, what will the people in this room think about me? They're all stories that share a common thread where there is silence and the only way for there to be healing and change is for someone to break it. And that's what ties these stories in with the story we are about to read from the Bible today. So if you have your Bibles with you, or on your phones, we're turning to Judges chapter 3. I've also, for your convenience, printed out the passage and put it in the back of each section. There are some papers. I'd encourage you, as we do read this passage, to take some notes, either in your Bible or your app or on those papers, because there are some really cool things about this story that I hope you will want to remember as we read it and take some notes on it. But spoiler alert, this story is not for the faint of heart. It's a strange time in the period of Israel's history. And the strangeness, the ugliness of this story, I think points to the fact that I think the Bible is true and honest. It's not going to shy away from the gory details and from the hurt and the pain. So just as a spoiler, we're going there today. And like I said, if you don't like it, Rick's coming back. <laughs> but the setting is that Moses, you know, led the people out of Egypt through the wilderness. And jo then Moses died just outside of the promised land. And then there was this guy, his name started with a J. You remember his name? 
Joshua, who led the people from that point into the promised land, and then Joshua died, and then there was this period called the Judges. And it was a time of a little bit of chaotic uh, elements there, where there was no leadership in the land. And as Beth had pointed out this morning, we start in verse 12, where it says that the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, who was what? King of Moab against Israel. It's going to be important. Because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, who? Uh, might be important. Uh, 18 years. And then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Did you hear that? The silence in that passage? Let's look at it at verse 14 again. The people served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. So maybe it wasn't so bad. Maybe Eglon was this nice guy who kind of you know, gave the Israelites what they wanted. That's why they waited so long, right? Well, if you keep on reading in the story, you will find some clues that lead us other ones. For example, you will find later on in this story um, that the king is specifically mentioned in verse 17 as being a very fat man. Now, the Bible usually skips physical descriptions of people and things. Like, the Bible's not like, oh, the red furry fox skips through the wild woods. You know, it's not very descriptive like that. It just kind of says it as it is. But here, for some reason, the biblical author said, you know, it's important that you all who are reading it will know that this Eglon, king of Moab, was a very fat man. And is it because... God is insensitive to larger people. No. In fact, in the culture back then, it was actually good to be fat. And here's why. Because if you were fat, that means that you had plenty of food resources, which was a high commodity in the ancient world, and you didn't have to do the physical labor all day. They didn't have labor day. They had, you know, the king is big day. So you had lots of servants, lots of slaves, so that the person in charge didn't have to do the work, thus he was bigger. And there's a biblical writer even, his name is Asaph, who wrote this song in Psalm 73 that says, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they had no pangs until death, and their death, and their bodies are fat and sleek, they're not in trouble as others are, they're not stricken like the rest of the mankind. It's like the psalmist was really envious of the fat guy. So, I'm just going to have to insert this free bit of counseling here. This is completely free. That those of you who do struggle with body image, and I do realize that I'm not an expert on this, and what I'm about to say doesn't fix anything, but I hope that this gives you some perspective that our fixation on the skinny body is both recent and cultural. So if you're looking at your body and saying, well, that's not enough, you might take the time to ask, well, who told you that? So that's your free counseling for this morning. But back to the point. God doesn't just call this king fat for fun. But he does to open the Israelites' eyes to what it is they have been sacrificing their well-being for these 18 years. That while they have been silent and working hard, this king had grown wealthy, fat, and lazy on their account. Ah, I found my microphone. Turn that back on. <laughs> so, 18 years in this oppression. 18 years is a long time. 18 years was when, ago was when Star Wars Episode 3 came out. You know, that was, that was a while back. It was 18 years ago when Hurricane Katrina hit. 
It was when a well-known website at the time named YouTube first started. A lot can happen in 18 years. But imagine 18 years from that point till now, sacrificing your own well-being for someone that cares little or nothing for you. But do we not know those who are similar in our lives? I think we all know people who are caught in the lies of addiction, that we can say they are sacrificing their own well-being for things that care nothing for them. And we can get really frustrated with the people around us who won't change because you can see the effects on them, but they don't see it at all. And before we start going pointing fingers at people, it's true of us too. It's true of me that we spend a lot of time sacrificing our own well-being for things that care little for us. The things I'm thinking about could be your own career or retirement plan, could be your grade and sporting performance. It could even be the sense of community or family that you have. None of these things are necessarily bad. But do you realize what you sacrifice for them? And how many years you have put in with the middle reward? So, we are all making sacrifices, I would argue, for something this morning. And the question I think this story is going to beg us to answer and ask is, do we seek it? Do we see the toll it is taking on us and those around us? And then this passage gives us hope because it wants us to open our eyes to those things. And it opens our eyes to how we can break the silence with God over whatever that is. You ready for that? You, you are nodding your heads, so I'll say yes. <laughs> All right. Well, the first way that this story opens our eyes is something we just read about in chapter 3. It's about this place that Moab entered and took residence in. Did you notice where, the Israel, where uh, King Moab, Eglon, took possession in verse 13? What was the city? Verse 13. City of Palms. Good. Believe it or not, we've heard of that city somewhere in Israel's past beforehand. If you want to write down under City of Palms the name Jericho, that is the place that the king has set up residency. For those of us not familiar with the story, Jericho was the very first city that Israel captured on its way into the Promised Land. And I don't know, it could be a coincidence, but I don't think there are many coincidences in scripture about like this. I think God is kind of subtly using this as a reminder to Israel, just as Israel was God's instrument to bring justice to the Canaanites, God's now using Moab to bring justice to Israel. Israel has become no different than the pre-settlement of Canaan. And before you protest, oh man, he's kind of reading into things a little much. Well, before pe the people of Israel got to Jericho, they actually did something like uh, cross the Jordan River. Anyone remember this story? They crossed the Jordan River, God parts the Jordan River for them to cross over, and they take these stones and they pick them up and put them on the banks um, nearby. And Joshua tells the people that these stones are meant to be reminders for Israel that God is with them, that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and that they may fear the Lord your God forever. These physical reminders of what God had done for them. And those stones were set up in a place called Gilgal, which is going to become important in this story because it's mentioned twice in this story. Coincidence? I don't think so. I can't help but think that these two physical place reminders, Jericho and Gilgal, are reminders that God has with his people to say, 
You were different once. And now those stone symbols of remembrance have become idols. Now the very place where God has shown victory is a place you're experiencing defeat. And if you, maybe the lesson for us is that if you elevate something to such a point that you're sacrificing your own emotional well-being, sacrificing your own connection with your church family, sacrificing the ability to discern right and wrong for that thing, how different are you from those who don't follow Jesus? That was, I think, the question God was implying in those places. At the same time, there is a beautiful reminder reminder here, because my intent in the passage's intent, I don't think, is to shame the people of God into repentance. It rarely lasts that way. The intent, I think, is to remind God's people that the very places that evil took up residency were the places that God had already been to them. That the very places you may be afraid to let God into at the very places God has already been with the whole time. So there's just a little encouragement as we go forward in the story of what will happen if we break the silence with God. But the, the story gives us more encouragement. And as I lead on, get ready. This is where it gets crazy. The people of Israel, verse 15, cry out to the Lord, and the Lord raises up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Jerah, the Benjaminite, take note, Benjaminite, or Benjamin means son of the right hand. But there is something you should know. Ehud is not right-handed. He is, in fact, left-handed, is what we learn later on. He is a left-handed man. So God is already playing a little bit, having some fun with the story. Did you know that God has fun telling us stories? So here it is. That he's a left-handed man, and the people of Israel sent tribute. We know that word as grain offering, meant for God, but it's tribute that now goes by him to Iglon the who? He had made for himself a sword with two edges. This word two edges. It's kind of like earlier when I said that there was a sticky situation and you guys laughed because it meant two meanings, right? This word two edges also has two meanings. It could be a two-edged or two-mouthed, like speaking out of both sides of your mouth. As if there will be uh, something else in the story that will be a little deceptive later on. So God is fun telling this story. And he made this sword, and it was a cubit in length, which is about from your knuckles down to your elbow, which is very short for a sword if you've ever wielded a sword. That's how big it was. Um, and he bound it in his right thigh under his gloves. Now, this is very important, because he was about to sneak somewhere with a sword. And back then, if you had a sword, you usually strapped it on your left side, because most people who were fighting were right-handed, so they'd be able to pull from their left side, and bam! So they would always search the left side for the sword. But, because Ehud was left-handed, he strapped it at his right side, and he was able to get past security. Alright? a very important info there. Uh, under his clothes, he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. When he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute, but he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal. We already talked about those. And said, I have a secret message for you. Here's where it's funny. That word message could mean I have a secret message for you. It could just mean I have a secret thing for you. I got something secret for you, King. It's right here, strapped to my right thigh. He's not being receptive at all. He's playing with words a little bit. And so, I have a secret message or thing for you, O King. And the King, thinking it's a message from the gods, says, Silence. All the attendants went out from his presence, and Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his roof cool chamber. Could be the upper chamber of his house, or it could actually mean the bathroom. This is going to be interesting. 
Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. That seat can mean throne or toilet. Because back then, a man's throne was still his toilet. Um, he rose from his seat. See, God has such a sense of humor. Okay, this is funny. And he had reached his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade. The flat coat closed over the blade. Um, for he did not pull the sword out of the belly, which probably means that the sword did not have a cross uh, section right here. It just had, like, you gave me a perfect concealment. You never thought this stuff in the Bible, did you? This is, this is good stuff. The hilt also went in, and the dung came out. This is a little quick aside for all my middle school people in here. God just made a poop joke. He hit him so hard that the poop came out. For the rest of the adults, Rick's coming back next. Right. So, hymns are that the dung came out. This is going to be providential poop later on. Just think about that. Uh, then Ehud went out into the porch, which could be either the actual porch and he's going to jump off of it, or if you turn your paper that I gave you on the other side, it has a little illustration that I don't think is up there um, because I didn't get it in on time. But it's kind of like. He either jumped off the porch or he went down the like sewage system into the little sewage care room and out. So it's a little mission impossible, but he gets getting out of there one way or the other. He closed the doors, the roof chamber behind him and locked them. And when he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he's relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. I wonder why they thought that. Because of the providential poop. Okay? They thought he was believing himself, so they waited. When he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them. There the Lord lay dead on the floor. And then we learned that that gave Ehud time to escape. Wow. He had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the idols, escaped to Sirah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel. There they are. You haven't seen the people of Israel this whole story. Here they are. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country. He was their leader. And he said to them, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies the Moabites into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of Jordan against the Moabites. They did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at the time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able bodied men, not a man of state. So Moab was subdued that day in the hand of Israel and the land of rest for 80 years. Aren't you glad that came to church this morning? <laughs> That's a crazy story. That's a little dude. But I think even here, in the messiness of this story, there is something that God is teaching his people. And that thing is this. Let's review. That there is this guy named Ehud, who is a Benjaminite. Like I said, God's making a little joke to his name. But at the same time, this guy is from a tribe that we learn few chapters earlier, refused to take over their whole portion of the promised land. That when they got to capturing Jerusalem, they are like, yeah, the Jebusites can kind of stay there for a while. They're fine. You don't need to conquer them. And you're like, maybe, maybe that's a small detail, but maybe because he's from the tribe of Benjamin, a foreign king might trust him a little bit. And these guys failed to conquer other people. He probably won't do anything about this guy, right? And then we learn the whole left-handed business, which gives him the security of the dagger. Then we learn about how the way God the providential poop, where he was able to escape. And we just think that this rescuer and what happened is exactly the perfect fit for the task at hand. That this rescuer that God raised up was the perfectly fitted one for what needed to happen. Any other lover, after 18 years of abandonment, would have scoffed at the idea of getting back together. But not God. When the people cry out to God again, God doesn't respond with that classic parenting phrase, it's like, no long enough. He didn't go with that, uh, maybe you'll get second string this time. 
God responded swiftly with the exact right man for the job. It's almost as if God couldn't wait for his people to turn back to him. It's almost like God was just as much excited to rescue his people this time as he had every time before. Do you believe that? Do you believe that every time you call out to God, he is just as excited to hear you as the first time that you believe? I was reminded of this recently from a pastor preaching on the prodigal son story. You know, the prodigal son story is that great story where the, the son goes and squanders all he has and returns to the father. The father runs out to meet him. And we use that story to say, we should evangelize and new people should come to Jesus. That's how excited Jesus is, that new people come to him. But did you know that God gets just as excited every time you as a believer come along? You as a one who has already cried out to Jesus, you continue to call out to him? So that we get just as excited about discipleship as we do about evangelism? Tell Paige I said that. That's advertising for next week. But our God is not like Peter, who asked the question of Jesus, uh, how many times do I have to forgive this guy? Like seven times? No. Oh. God says, keep coming to me 70 times, seven times, and see if that scratches the surface how excited I am to see you and to rescue you and to keep journeying with you. Do you believe that about our God this morning? Well, there's one more very important aspect of this story. And if you have my hand out, it's that little strange um, outline of the story. And it's really to point out, oh, it's on the screen like that. The story is a chiasm. It's a really fancy word about the way the biblical stories are structured. But mainly, the point is that the very middle, where it says F right there, is the most important part of the story in the way that the stories are. So verses 21 and 22 are the most important part of the story according to the way that the story is written. And something very interesting happens in verses 21 to 22, besides it being slightly graphic, is the writer changes some words there. So, if you look back and if you're writing things down, the word for fat that was used earlier is changed. It's no longer used of, it was the word that was used of just a normal fat, whatever. And now it is the fat that was in this verse is the fat that was usually covering the entrails of a sacrificed animal. Again, a little graphic, but interesting. But then the sword, the sword is changed. The word is not just sword like it was before, but the sword has a different word here, meaning flame. It's a flame. Maybe tying all both of those words together is the fact that Eglon, who was who? What is he? King of Moab. King of Moab. His name means calf. His name means calf. So in this very central part of the story, the suggestion is that Eglon, who has been called king several times up to now, he's not really a king. He's really a calf fattened for the slaughter of a burnt offering. Because of the flame and the fat and all of that imagery that's changed in this passage. Now you're thinking, oh boy, Matthew's already done poop jokes, now he's doing human sacrifices in all temple doom on us. But let me be perfectly clear, the Bible does not condemn human sacrifice. They know it. But, I do think that God has a little bit of a sense of a human sense of humor here, as I've said, that this story is slightly comedic. That perhaps God is comedically telling this story about a human king turned calf to make the Israelites 
laugh at how silly they were to sacrifice their well-being to this guy. This fattened cat is what we've been slaving for this whole time? It's kind of like the Bogart in Harry Potter. If you've seen or read Harry Potter books, the Bogart is that creature that forms uh, whatever you fear most, and the way to defeat it is through laughter. Because you must make it for force it to assume it to find it easy. Because, you know, laughter is really good in conquering fear. Did you ever think that we had a God who knew enough about human nature that he doesn't just command obedience, but he provides comedic relief to make space for obedience? Huh, it's a fun thought. It's perhaps what Jesus was getting at in Luke 12 when he says that there's this guy who is storing up crops and tears down barns to build bigger barns to store his grain and his good goods. And the man says, I'm going to say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax and drink, be merry, enjoy all this stuff. But the next verse, God says to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you prepare, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself who is not rich toward God. Those things that we have been slaving for, whatever that may be, the job raise, the good things for our family, the grades, the whatever it is, they may be good things, but isn't it laughable? how small they are in the realm of eternity. I think that's what God's getting at. But then you just wonder, okay, these are hints and pieces. Why is this story in the Bible? I could have gotten all that somewhere else. I think here's the point. God is teaching us from this whole story, and if you put up the next slide, that the people of Israel were sacrificing their well-being for the good of a king. Alright? That's how it started. And then, at the climax, the king is sacrificed like a bull for the good of the people. This is the switch there, right? And again, like I said earlier, everyone is making sacrifices for something this morning. And the question is, are you doing the first type of sacrifice? Are you sacrificing your good for the good of something else? Or is that something else being sacrificed for your good? And here is the kicker from our story. The people aren't the one making the sacrifice. The people are charging in the King Eglon's fortress and taking him down. God sends a rescue. In fact, if all of you hear from this story, besides you really want to bring it back, <laughs> is that we need to put to death our stuff, we need to fight really hard, we need to be like Ehud and make that sacrifice in our lives, if that's what you're hearing in response to me this morning, then we've got it all wrong. No wonder church burns people out so much and that's the message that you hear from us week after week. It's just too hard. Yeah, we should work hard but if that becomes the only thing it becomes this relentless treadmill of self-made religion that is no better than any other one. Ah, but friends, there's a way off the treadmill. Paul himself alludes to it when he talks about spiritual warfare. You would think in Ephesians 6, when he's talking about the full armor of God, that Paul would say, use that armor and fight hard against the enemy. That's not what Paul said. In Ephesians 6, the main command in that passage is be strong in the Lord in the strength of His might, and therefore stand. 
stand. Kind of like the Israelites at the end of our, you know the story? We're just kind of standing at the board of Jordan, just waiting for the already defeated enemy to come at them. Our job as believers and followers of Christ is not to work this relentless tread. It's to call upon Jesus, which is the missing part in the story if you go to the next. Well, there we go. People cry out to the Lord. <laughs> that Ehud is not first an example for us to remove our obsessions from their place of control over our lives. Ehud is first a pointer to one greater than him who would fight our battles for us and whom we can call out to day after day. That person is Jesus. Jesus, who is the one, like Ehud, exactly fitted for the task at hand. Because he was God, he was able to win the battle. And because he's human, he's able to fight our battle. And so Colossians 2 says that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities, put them to open shame by triumphing over them in the cross. It's almost like the Ehud story is exactly pointing to those very verses. And if Jesus can disarm Satan, defeat death, put them to open shame, he can surely take down whatever Satan has on the throne of your heart. His sacrifice for us has paved the way for all the many sacrifices we need to break through. For 2 Corinthians 2 says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. So remember this. If you think about this crazy sermon on Labor Day of this guy, your life always involves sacrifice. It always does. You're either letting something be king of your heart and sacrificing your own well-being to it, or you're day by day calling out to Jesus, letting him be the rescuer who sacrificed it all and continues to sacrifice for your well-being. And the question we're left with is, well, which one is, which cost is greater to me? Which cost? is greater. So, let's finish that Ehud story and wrap up, shall we? I think the Moabites did not disappear from the Israelites' story, do they? The Moabites will come back again and again. But just a few generations later, a Moabitess named Ruth comes on the scene, becomes part of the Jewish people, eventually becomes a descendant of Jesus. You see, when you surrender to Jesus and call out to him, I can't promise those things that you struggle with will disappear out of your life forever. That's not the promise. But I can promise that if you break the silence with him, cry out to him daily, instead of those things ruling your life, you'll find yourself and those things part of a bigger better story than you could have hoped or imagined. That's the promise of the story. Crazy though, maybe. That's the promise of this table that we get to partake of right now.